Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Open Agenda Panel, Keeping the Web Open, moderated by Dan Applequist, the Open Web Advocate. Please give them a warm welcome. Folks, uh, can you hear me? Okay, good. So, hi, and welcome to our panel where we're going to be introducing and launching uh, something called the Open Agenda, and I'll explain a little bit about what that is. Um, but uh, first, uh, to introduce myself, I'm the Open Web Advocate for Telefonica Digital. Um, and what we're going to be talking about today and throughout the context of the Open Agenda is, is openness and open in technology. And, and the word open, I think, in, in technology can take, can take many forms, it can take many definitions. Um, you can have uh, open source software, you can have open standards, which don't necessarily mean royalty-free standards, or they could mean royalty-free standards. Uh, you could have open access as in, a, as in access to the internet, access to publications, open protocols, open development. Um, when we talk about the open web here today, uh, we're going to be talking about the platform of technologies developed in the open uh, that enables open access to information and services globally. Uh, the kind of openness that has been fundamental for the good of uh, consumers and businesses in the public sector. And it, uh, you know, we're working uh, right now on a number of fronts on this in, in Telefonica, and so this is kind of a, the kind of a, a key topic for us. Um, however, uh, right now we perceive that there are some, um, some forces looking towards a more closed future. Uh, with the internet and with internet services and applications in particular. Um, so the open agenda and what we're launching today is uh, something that's it's a campaign to, pro to promote a kind of civil discourse and debate around uh, the benefits of open philosophy for technology, uh, for digital innovation, and how it can create a uh, positive impact for consumers, businesses, governments, etc., and for, for also society, really. Um, so. Today we're going to focus on the open web. Um, one of the things that I like to think about is the original vision of the web, and and you know having w lived through and worked through the, the the kind of birth of the web, my perspective on it is that it's it, the web was originally uh, a kind of intended as a universal source for information, a universal kind of read-write space, um, but the web is evolving, and in particular, it's evolving. Uh, now to encompass new form factors, new devices, new user interaction uh, paradigms, new types of content. Um, and in the process, it's also, we've also seen the rise of, of the app. Um, so you've got some companies that are creating kind of disconnected and impenetrable uh, silos around apps and around uh, uh, native applications uh, and app stores. and. Uh, and this has led to a kind of return to the walled garden approach that we saw in the late 90s, uh, mid to late 90s, I, I should say, around uh, companies like AOL, Microsoft Network, um, and these kinds of closed portals um, that, that were uh, they're kind of interposing themselves in the value chain uh, between the users and, and the, and the, um, and the uh, service providers and content providers. So to debate and talk about that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quit talking now, believe it or not. Um, so to, to debate and to talk about these topics and, and explore this, some of these issues and some other issues around open and open software and open development, um, we've got four panelists here. We've got, um, and I'll let them introduce themselves, actually. Uh, so uh, go ahead. Hello, my name is John Mad Dog Hall. I'm the executive director of Linux International. I've been in the computer industry for 44 years, and I think that what I would like to bring out is the concept of whether or not some of these closenesses are evilly intent or where they are financially the things that allow things to happen. So whether your company is evil or not, that's a subject you can talk about. So. Hi, I'm Richard Bridget. Uh, I'm from Populous. We're a research company. We did a, uh, a study for Telefonica as part of this, into the views of 16-year-olds across the globe, into what they use the internet for now, what they want to use it for in future, and how they think it's going to develop. So I'm going to bring kind of their perspective to, uh, to the debate. 
I'm Chris Harman from Mozilla, and I'm the open web evangelist for them. And the web has been good for me, and I'm not going to let them take away from us. <laughs> My name is Alistair Blackwell. I'm Chief Technology Officer at Decoded. We run workshops training teachers how to teach code across the curriculum. And I've just launched a foundation to, give them, uh, to provide that for free, which is very exciting. Uh, I'm a web designer and developer, uh, and I'm a passionate advocate of using web technologies to empower young people to, to learn computer science. So I think that's an interesting, rich kind of set of perspectives there. I think maybe, maybe I could call on Christian first to kind of um, give his perspective on my, what, you know, what I was talking about in the in the kind of introduction. Like, what 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 do you think about where we stand in terms of the development of the web and you know, open versus closed and apps versus web, that kind of thing. I think there is a honeymoon period of apps at the moment. People are getting incredibly excited about apps being the only thing that works on devices, giving them the best experience, giving them the best uh, opportunities. And there's a lot of marketing materials out there for, uh, uh, for young engineers getting into the market saying, like, if you want to make money, make a closed app, put it on the iStore and you will get two millions tomorrow. Which, is, uh, uh, which happened the same way with Flash before, and it happened with other closed technologies. I'm thinking we're at the brink of where people are starting to understand that uh, whilst uh, having apps give them a, a fast, quick solution, they also lock them in and make them limited. And thinking back to actually finding out what the web was about, uh, the, 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 the joke is always to say that the browser is the last app that you use on your phone when you didn't find another app to do the thing that you wanted to do. But I find more and more people that realize that putting in a calculation into Google is much easier than downloading a calculator app, installing it, giving away your credit card number, giving away your information, downloading 15 Mac, and then not liking it and uninstalling it again. So the the limited, uh, the limited use case of the app that made it a success is actually right now making it not as interesting for a lot of people. And I just hope that we understand that uh, you do things for one purpose and not for consumption. And I would love to see the app market, first of all, and also the web, getting more into a space where we can become makers and consumers. Because I've seen tablets and phones with the app space not only limiting people in what they can buy or that they have to have money to get access to functionality, but also become just consumers. And I think the web is too good for that. So, Ali, in your work with young people on, on, on an educational front, do you sense this kind of hunger for, for people to get involved in, in making? And uh, you know, what, what does that look like to, for, to you? I think there's a real hunger once it's inspired in young people. I think without that initial spark of inspiration and excitement and enthusiasm for making stuff, young people are very happy to just passively consume the technology that the big corporations and that everyone who's out there makes, which is fine. Uh, but once they've been given that bug, ideally by a teacher in the classroom, uh, in the formal uh, curriculum at school, um, and can you know they learn that they can actually just go and make stuff and that the web is this open platform where you can just publish once and deploy it to seven billion people. It's not seven billion though, is it? It's two billion. That's the problem with internet access. Uh, but you can deploy it to everyone with an internet connection. It's very exciting for them to see they can be architects of, uh, of technology rather than just users. But how does that translate to mobile? Um, I suppose, do, do kids have the same perception? Maybe I could ask Richard as well. Do kids have the same per the same perception about use of the web on mobile or their ability to reach out to that number of people when they develop things on mobile? Or I mean, at the moment, with 16-year-olds, with it's a real generational difference. You know, For a lot of the people who were around when the web came about, it was desktop-based, it was computer-based. And the move to apps is the exception rather than the rule. For 16-year-olds, apps is the norm, using it on mobile devices is the norm. And so if they ever think about contributing to uh, the development of the web, they think about building an app directly for a mobile device. The thing is, coming back to your point about having to inspire young people, Ali, most young people, honestly, they don't really want to build an app. They don't really want to build the web themselves. It makes about as much sense to them building a new app 
to try and get the kind of web they want as it does designing your own clothes if you want to try and dress better. You know, they just, just, they are used to being consumers, they want to be consumers, and they'll go out and they'll choose what they want, but they want other people to develop that, and they, to be honest, are quite happy to see it shaped. So there's a, there's a kind of, there is a mental barrier to get over because the vast majority are not yearning to shape it themselves at the moment. They just want to pick the winners and enjoy the fruits of that. Mm. But isn't that partly what teachers are about and what parents should be about as well? If that's the next generation and we have a generation of consumers, there wouldn't be any music, there wouldn't be any writing, there wouldn't be anything. Well, I mean, everybody's got their own kind of calling. So it's not to say that there aren't people out there doing it. It's just... It's not a case that they are attached to a particular form of the web and they're not attached to a particular idea. They don't aspire for it to be open. They aspire for it to be useful and to be helpful and to do what they want. And at the moment, if you want to use Facebook on a mobile device, the best way that they believe you can do that is you go through the app. And until that game changes and it becomes better to do open web or to actually do it directly, they're kind of one at the moment to the app scene. But the app can be open web. The app can be HTML5. It doesn't have to be... Uh, it, the, the, uh, I think there's a big misconception when this whole debate is on that people think the open web means you go to a browser, you type something in. An app can be done with open web technology and it's still an, open, it's still an app. The end user doesn't know the difference, but it still means it can be reused. Yeah, you're right, they, they, don't, they haven't got a clue about that difference. And to be honest, they don't really, they don't care. That's good. They, they want to use it. I think that's what's really exciting now about Firefox OS and other um, innovations in the mobile space or whatever, is that you can now build an app in web technologies. And it is an app. It's not a crappy website with a lolcat and a, you know, in space or whatever. It's uh, an interactive, <laughs> dynamic app. It might be a game, uh, and it's built in web technology. So it is, uh, in the, just the last three or four years, this uh, transition from... HTML equals static website and native app equals amazing interactive app to web apps. Not but just you can you can hold you can drop the web prefix apps being built with web technologies. I think that's very exciting. John, can I or Mad Dog, if I may call you Mad, Mad Dog. Dog? Yes. Um, can uh, what, what, what's your perception of you know this from a from from sort of an open source ecosystem perspective from you know. So from an open source ecosystem, I've seen a lot of people complain about the same thing. There's a lot of people that use Linux, for example. They just pull it down. They never contribute to it. They never change it, you know. They're just consumers of it. That's perfectly okay, okay? Because not everybody is going to be a developer. No more than everybody is a brain surgeon. But some people can apply a bandage, all right? So it's okay. The, the concept here is volume. What did the internet give us? It gave us something that comes into our home, but unlike TV, you can actually give something back if you want to. It gives you the opportunity to do that. It gives you the visibility to do that. And if you have seven, or if you have five billion people or three billion people that's using it, you'll have half a billion people who say, I have a new idea, you'll have a uh, quarter of a billion people who say, hey, I have the expertise and the idea to do it. And you'll have 200,000 people who will write interesting style of applications, whether they're using HTML, whether they're using some type of thing. It's the volume, it's the, it's the availability. And so I have met a kid in Johannesburg, South, in South Africa, who it was actually the town of Soweto where he was advising Linus Torvalds about how to fix the Linux kernel because of a bug that was inside the Linux kernel. This is from a poor black community that the government swore there was not a single person in there that knew anything about free and open source software. It gives the opportunity. And, you, and as they say, nobody knows when you're a dog on the internet. So, you know, all the people on the internet want is show me the except, code. Except the NSA, possibly. <laughs> <laughs> good, thing, good thing you went there. <laughs> now, now, now there's some place we're going to talk about open and closed, okay? <laughs> yeah. um, but I, I think rolling it back, I, uh, how do we get here to this place where 
people's expectation and young people's expectation and pretty much everybody's expectation, the mainstream expectation is that in order to get access to uh, application or services on your, on your phone, you go to an app and you go to an app store. And what, you know, wh how do we get here and is it possible to roll, to roll us back into a more open, uh, and, and what, what, you know, is, is, is it desirable to roll back? I guess is 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 one I put it to the panel. I think I think it's convenience and it's also communication. Like we we've been doing a good job building things for the web, but we haven't been doing a good job advocating it to people and explaining it to people who just don't care what the thing does. Like it's very uh, same with open source. A lot of times when you start talking about open source, you tell people like, well, you get this built and then you go to the command line and you do these 20 different tools and then it sometimes works. Whereas the Apple guy says like, you put it on, you press this button and it works. So we have to get better at getting people to realize that potential that they have, that there is the choice to become somebody to, that can customize the thing, that you don't have to pay to play as a developer, as a creator. And a lot of people don't realize that this is a big thing. I came from radio originally, and I found the internet and realized I can publish worldwide for free, more or less free. I don't have to, I don't have to pay for the radio station. I don't have to commit a crime to be in the news. I, I, I can do that myself. And uh, this is somehow has been lost on the way that people don't realize that their voice can be heard. So it's something we have to be better in. And I think just explaining very technical terms very simply is a task that is not fulfilled by enough people. Mm. Well, let's say, you know, what, let, let's isolate what's wrong with the App Store versus what might be right with the App Store. The App Store would give you a place to put an application to allow somebody to download it easily and stuff. But what tends to be wrong with the App Store is that there's some entity which decides whether or not your app can go into the App Store. And there's another entity that says you have to pay to put your app into the App Store. And, you know, and all these things are limiting what goes in and what allows people to do. Maybe in a free and, and open economy, you say, well, I'm going to put my app into the App Store. Some people will load it down and give a thumbs down or a thumbs up. And if there's too many thumbs down, people just don't just stop downloading it anymore. So you know, let's let's concentrate. It's not that apps are bad; it's that apps that are written to one target uh, the, the target platform are bad because it doesn't give you the app in every platform you are, which says HTML5 might be the way to go. It's not that the app necessarily is bad because you can write an app in HTML5. It's the way that the app is controlled that's bad. And I think, I think that's really important because these are issues that get conflated all the time when we have this apps and web debate. We don't understand, or, or we need to tease apart sometimes the issues of how you, how you find the app, how the app is, excuse me, but monetized. I don't like the word, but monetized. How um, people, you know, what, what technology is used to develop the app, what kinds of uh, devices it can run on and you know wh whether or not it, and then whether or not it's open whether it whether it is developed against an open protocol or, or whatever if you if you if you can pay to move your app higher up and to scale to be the first thing that somebody sees when they search for an app of a particular type that's not very in, in one way it's not very open but in another way, it's the same type of thing as it happens at a food store when the company pays to have their cans of corn put up at the front of the aisle or at the edge of the aisle instead of in the middle of the aisle. So, you know, is this a free and open source economy where people can pay to get their application noticed by more people? And, uh, and, that, and that pays to get the application distributed and stuff? Or is that something that's bad? And we should not be, you know, or maybe we should, we should have a little flag beside it that says, I paid to have my application shown to you. It, well, I'm not going to buy that one. This already <laughs> happens on Google when you search for content on the web. And if, this, if, if everything does go to plan as it should and, and websites do become web apps, because it doesn't necessarily need to be a big cultural change in people's expectations. I think as, as the web gets richer with new technologies that are coming out all the time and as uh, device manufacturers open up the hardware, 
using, um, you know, open, open them up using kind of the APIs that you're working on, Dan, in the working group, the sort of contacts API and the phone API. As that happens more and more and websites become apps, Google will essentially become the app store, potentially, and websites will be apps. And in the same way that you have sponsored listings, and I guess as long as we live in a, a free market capitalist world, that's okay, you know, if you think that's okay, which is another debate entirely. Uh, but yeah, I think it's, it's kind of, yeah, it's all going in the right direction, I think. Well, that's the thing Firefox OS does it. That's we, uh, what, we, what we do and what we're breaking in that model is that you can actually search for a band to find music apps and not have to know the name of the music, band, music app or go to the marketplace and click on I want music apps. Because then you have the problem that marketing and who pays the most is the first app that you show, not the one that has the music that you're interested into. There might be a punk only band uh, a music app that will never go onto the front page of Apple, but they would, you would find that by entering punk. So the, uh, the searchability of the web was the biggest power of it. You can become the New York Times for a certain topic because you have wrote a blog post, put it somewhere, other people linked to it, found it. It was a democratic way to get information out there and not a way that actually is defined by one company and people paying more or less money to be on the front page. Access, sorry, accessing unknown or unheralded sources of information is probably the key weaknesses of apps. Mm. The, um, the, the thing which makes apps so appealing to young people at the moment is, number one, their simplicity. They often just, just work, and Apple's got a lot to answer for that. It, it changed a lot of young people's experience of the web from being something that was quite complex and you needed some understanding to you press the button on your screen and you were there. The other one was vertical integration. If you know you want Facebook, if you know you want Twitter, if you know you want Amsterdam, then at the moment, using an app is the best way of getting there. But if you're not sure what you want, if you're hunting for something, that's where the app falls down. And you know, web apps, websites, can make up the ground and simplicity through developing it. The, the, kind of the, the way it can actually overcome apps as they are currently developed is the fact that it can also open up the panorama of accessing unknown sources in the way that you spoke about in a way that currently vertically integrated but siloed apps don't. Mm. I think there's another issue which is uh, scalability of the app mechanism. I, I just had lunch at Gourmet Burger Kitchen around the corner here and I was immediately asked on, you know, one, on paying f for my burger, uh, oh, do you have our app? I'm like, no, I, d I don't have your <laughs> app. You know, I, I, I <laughs> what does it taste <laughs> like? I, I, yeah, <laughs> I want a burger. I, I don't want an app, right? Um, you know, I already, I already have a Starbucks app. I've got, you know, how, you know, how many apps, how many, do I need an app for every restaurant that I go to? Is that, surely that's not really a scalable model. Uh, I found the research interesting when I saw people having like 120, 140 apps on their phone and using five of them. It's just, uh, it's like Pokemons. People collect them all because they were cool for a minute <laughs> and then they wonder why their memory is slow uh, and their, f their phone is slow. It's, we invented the web not to have an app for everything and it's just incredible that we're going back in time for that. Mm. I remember when I had to download something to take a picture and edit the picture and upload it somewhere else. Those were three different pieces of software. Now it could be one app or it could be just in a browser and wrapped in something. We're going back to the model that we had. Download.com, twocows.com is where I got software. Nowadays, these things look like shopping malls after the zombie attack. And uh, I think more and more app markets will look like that after a while. Yeah. Um, by the way, we are, we are taking questions on Twitter. If you have a burning question for the panel, um, if you want to have your voice heard in an open way, um, then you can tweet on the hashtag the open agenda. It's up here on the screen. Um, and uh, I will, using the power of the open web, uh, siphon off the best questions. Or indeed, you can ask questions simply by holding your hand up. Um, in, uh, so we'll, we'll start taking questions in about five minutes, five, six minutes, something like that. So um, I wanted to get back to the, the way that kids perceive this openness. Is that something that we think, maybe Richard, is that something that we think is, is a key element to so-called Generation Z or Z or however you want to pronounce it? Z. Z. <laughs> Z. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, y young people 
for the internet really kind of it's just it's always been there it's not that special they just see it as a, a, as an extension of real life and so they don't see it as having anything kind of special to it to, to some degree they don't actually most of them don't have the love which kind of can pick up from you Christian kind of for the early days of the web when it you know it was it was open but it was it was a little bit kind of dangerous almost but it was lovely they they kind of haven't had that experience um, and so they're not emotionally tied to the idea of openness so maybe we should give them a modem for a week and then give them back the fast connection so they actually find out how awesome it is by now so well this this is one of my concerns okay we talk about these kids and stuff and their access to the net but if you come from upstate new hampshire in the united states you have a dial-up line at 9.6 and your perception of the web is considerably different than most people's okay and what i what i what i'm concerned about the the internet for the next 10 years is getting more speed more connectivity and more consistently across to the people that, that absolutely need it, and in an open way. And we talk about you know, shifting, shaping of internet loads and things like that. I think that is a big problem also. There's some superb projects like Brick, for example, which is a, a, for African uh, countryside. It's just basically a brick that is battery powered and solar powered that gives a wireless hotspot. And there's lots of Kickstarters that are going in that direction. I think it's a very important point that we understand that without connectivity, whatever we're trying to do here is not going to make a difference because people can't reach it. Exactly. And, 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 and most importantly, we need to get governments to understand this because if they buy into the fact that everybody has the internet, has the web, then they have disenfranchised people. Okay, they have taken away their, their right, their ability to have the information to vote to do that. So we have to push. Once upon a time in the United States, there's a rural electrification project. There was the post office creating the Pony Express. There was the idea that you had a right to have access to this and the government was there to help you get it. It was all privately done, but there was this push and we need to have the same thing for the internet. But we Sweden has that. Sweden has a government control that the internet access is a right and all these things you need to do for your house, all the general elections, all happen over the internet. And 100 megabit is the slowest line you can get. Then that's what we need. This is hi highlights to me some of the problems with the web as, the, as the, the platform for the future is that there are people in upstate New Hampshire on really slow connections. There are people all over the world with no connection and there are people with 100 gigabyte Google Fiber connections. Uh, and the same way there are people on different browsers, there are people in, um, you know, everyone's got a different experience of the web so it's hard for it to be um, uh, as slick and as effective at building really cool apps as something like the iPhone where it's native. And that's one of the problems with it. Like in, in defense of app stores, because I think we, you know, we say we're all agreeing, yeah. um, they, you know, th th there is a place for native, for, for proprietary platforms to um, be a, a bed for innovation and stuff. Like, let's see what, what technology in 2013 can do. Let's see what amazing augmented reality stuff that we can make, which on the web you wouldn't necessarily be able to support because the browser makers hadn't implemented, the you know, hadn't been standardized, all that kind of thing. Christian, we're, I mean, uh, the, the as we just heard from Carlos Domingo on this stage earlier this evening, um, uh, Firefox OS is targeted at some of those markets where there might be limited connectivity or high price connectivity. What, what, what capabilities are we now seeing come into the web platform that can help to address some, some of those issues? We had uh, offline capabilities for a long, long time. We had uh, opportunity to actually collate information and store it offline for later use for a long, long time. The only problem that the open standards had was that the implementation in closed platforms was buggy and was actually not working. So a lot of the uh, bad press that open technology gets is because closed platforms over-promised and under-delivered. And uh, as we defined uh, Firefox OS as an, open, uh, as an open source platform for emerging markets, we made it very, very clear from the very beginning that we have to make these fallback technologies work the best and not the high-end, beautiful 3D spinning, music, animation, blah, whatever. Uh, the thing has to work offline. The thing has to actually make sense that people can download and go offline. And when you, uh, you also have to know what kind of connectivity you have at the moment to say, please don't download data now. Do it later when I'm on a wireless. 
so this kind of functionality is in there. Going back to yours quickly, I think the difference that we don't know what the end user has was for me always the interesting bit about internet development. That anybody is invited to actually see what I'm doing is a great thing. And what people don't understand is that web development, I'm talking web development, not web app development, when your site looks the same on every single device, you've done something completely wrong. You've put a JPEG on the internet. It cannot be interactive. Y a, a good website actually looks better on a device that can do more or it works better on a device that can do more than on a slow device, but it should still give you the functionality of it. And apps have that problem that they have this uh, black and white state. You can, never have a, a fl uh, you can never have a changing system that actually realizes, hey, you're on a bigger screen right now, so I'll give you more buttons. It's actually defined to one screen size. So uh, having the interactivity in new technologies that we have with like media queries and adaptive design yeah, and offline functionality is just a great opportunity to build flexible things. I, I love that what I write or what I show, what I code looks different in different people's computers because then I know I've done something right. Yeah, so the, the, the responsive design I think is the buzzword that, that we're hearing a lot these days and I think it's like a, w w one of the really good examples of responsive design that I've seen recently was the, um, uh, awesome I Globe. think both BBC News and uh, Guardian are using it, where they send down a very highly compressed version of an image, and then they decide, should b based on a number of criteria, including perception of bandwidth, should I send down the higher, uh, the higher b byte uh, count? Uh, version of that image is it appropriate right now, or should I just let let things be? And I think that would that would be particularly useful for people who are on her kind of on a low uh, bandwidth. Uh, Which yeah. is was kind of ironic, because when iPad 2 came out and Retina was the big thing, and out of a sudden everything had to be 25 megabit and crisp and everything, then people put that on the web, and then HTML5 was blamed for being slow for images that would never be sensible on the device that you look at with an HTML5 browser. So yeah. we, we keep doing that in software that we use the coolest, newest, fastest, most amazing, call it innovation, and then say like, look, the old stuff is outdated. You have to buy something new or you can't be part of it any longer. The same way uh, every hard drive I ever had, no matter how big it was, I managed to max it out 75% within two weeks just with stuff because it's there so I put things in there. <laughs> so we have to start understanding that like starting from the anybody can use and making it more beautiful for the high-end market might be a more sustainable way of building things. Well, what about um, wh one of the questions that's come over the tweet stream here is uh, uh, about security. So I think it's true that some people might perceive an app to be a more secure way to, you know, I. You know, in s some people have told me this, right? I mean, personally, I don't understand it. But I mean, is that is that something that we've seen in the perception of users? Is that something that we've seen in the perception of? Uh, and and what are we doing on the web, on mobile, to try and bust that? Uh, and and indeed, through through the development of, of of browsers and security software. This has been an argument about open source versus closed source for a long period of time that open source is supposedly less secure because people can look at the source code and see the bugs and everything that are in it. Versus uh, closed source, you can't see the holes and things like that. It is security through obscurity. If this was true, then obviously Microsoft would be the most secure operating system <laughs> on the planet, okay? And that, you know, I'm not saying that they are or aren't, but mm -hmm. it's, you know, I think that people understand that it can't, it's, that's not the problem. Mm. The security is a constant battle. You constantly have to be aware of it. And quite frankly, folks, nine-tenths of the people in this room are probably not in the most secure of space because you have other things to do with your life. So the real, the real way to security is you constantly look for the announcements of security holes, you constantly patch it, you constantly make sure your firewall is up to date, you constantly, you, you encrypt your data and things like that. It takes work to be secure. And uh, it takes work to have privacy. And with that, actually, applications that are hard to update because you are on a slow connection and it takes you a long time to update 20 meg and so you don't do it, is a big security problem. 
the easier software is to update, the easier it is to patch, the easier and the faster it is to actually make secure. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's uh, security through obscurity, much like closing my eyes and going through the traffic light and thinking that probably was green. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess also, until they crack HTTPS, I think that's only going to happen when we work out as human beings how to predict prime numbers. Is that right? Hash prism. Something like that, yeah. Oh, yeah, exactly. But we, we know that over the internet, whatever the um, source of the traffic, whether it's a website or a native app on a, an Apple device, it's still going to have to go from computer through the uh, routing of the internet to get there. And we know the NSA are already listening. So whether you're on a, a native platform or on the web, uh, until HTTPS is cracked, which fingers crossed it won't be, um, everyone's in the same boat, so right? It, it always seems strange to me that people claim that a native app, for instance, for a banking experience, might be more secure when, in fact, you know, you do, you can't determine the level of security. Everything about your banking could be being uh, passed around in the clear or behind uh, the, a native app. You don't know. You uh, so you know. At least within a browser, you you can examine the security chain. You can um, you know that it's it's in the clear. You you can see uh, who was this. You can tell whether you're being fished or not, that, yeah. that kind of thing. And, yeah. and uh, that's a little bit of media literacy, maybe. There was a, there was a large closed source company who, gave, who actually sold the capability of being able to look at their source code, but they did that by giving you an app that allowed you to look over the internet into their source code pool to look to see if there were any Trojan horses or things like that. The only problem was that there was no guarantee that the source code you were looking at was the source code that actually built your binaries. And since they didn't give you this code and the, and the tool chain to build it, you were taking their word that the source code you were looking at was the source code that actually built your binaries. It's also incredibly frustrating when you do a lot of good work in security and then end users just use password123 as their <laughs> password. So I think in terms of security, we have to, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a change in culture and I hope that all the things that are happening with the government spying on us is a wake up call to people to realize that you have to own your identity on the web and that passwords are just a, a, a stopgap solution. Passwords have to die. We work on this in the identity work in Mozilla and we're trying to actually find out what's going on. We looked at login systems. You sign up with a username, which is normally your email, and you set a password. When you forget the password, it sends something to that email to reset your password. So the password is unnecessary. We just need to know that that email is really you. And this is what we're doing with it. The next steps that we want to do is that you could go online and say like, I want to give that much information away from me. I'm fine if advertisers want to see some of my information, but I want to know what they know about me so I can tweak it that it's the real thing, not what they assume. So transparency and openness, and this is something we could talk for a few hours on, but yeah. I think it's incredibly important. I, I don't want to talk for too much longer on this, but I would like to tease this interesting bit of information uh, that I saw in this Pew uh, research study uh, last week or the week before about kids uh, and their interactions with apps and their perception of, of privacy um, and the fact that kids, this is, this is older kids, were avoiding the use of certain apps that they felt were going to give away too much of their personal data. And I, and I was wondering if any of that came through in your uh, polling of kids, Richard? Yeah, I mean, they're pretty astute. You know, they, they're going in with their eyes open. As far, as far as young people see it, and this is kind of uh, universal in New York, in Seoul, in Johannesburg, wherever we did the research. Um, the trade-off of going online and getting things which are personalized and customized and curated for you is that you have to surrender a certain level of information about yourself. Now, maybe that's just contact, maybe that's email address, maybe that's, it's more than that. But that always runs a risk, and they always expect that anything you put online could leak out, and it could be kind of used for malicious purposes, or what would be even worse for them is something that was private would kind of get found out at school, and then that would come back and get to them, because that's, that's death for a 16-year-old. You know, the idea that someone might hack your email account um, and kind of put in spam isn't so much of an issue. That's just an occupational hazard. The idea that someone would hack your email account and actually find out who you fancy at school, that's what kind of really got to them. But they're going in with their eyes open and they understand that 
online, um, it, for, for them, it, it's not ever secure. And so they've just got to take responsibility for it and trust that whatever they put online, um, if someone else got their hands on it, they could cope with it. I think in the web space, especially when we talk about pri privacy, we tend to get kind of wound up about what large corporations are doing with our, with our data. That's, that's actually the meaning of this hat I'm wearing, the Do Not Track header, which is uh, intended as a, as a way to, uh, to signal people uh, upstream from you when you're in a browsing session um, not to track you. It's still in, in development uh, and quite controversial. Um, but notably is, is, one of the, is one of the things, I, I think Firefox was one of the early, early, earliest impl implementers of it. Um, the, um, is, is that something that kids are worried, so you, you, you think that's something that kids, it's too, it's too not, abstract? Not, not really, you know, it's kind of, <laughs> when the NSA stuff came out, it was a case of, well, I always kind of assumed that we were being watched. And I kind of assumed that somebody was kind of behind their controlling it, because when I've tried to get copyrighted content, I've been blocked. Or when I've tried to get uh, kind of to things which maybe I shouldn't have, I've been restricted. And they, weren't qu they were never actually very sure who was doing it, but they, they assumed that there was kind of some org organization at arm's length that was controlling their experience at the outer bounds, at, at the very least. And as far as they're concerned, they're almost, you know, it's they're too small for it to matter. It will never happen to me, is kind of the, the kind of common refrain. So it's just brutal. I mean, it's the same when people, whenever you talk privacy and people are like, well, I've, if you've got nothing to hide, you've got nothing to fear. What you really have to fear is what stories people make up from that piecemeal information that they collect from you in random times and what kind of person they paint from that information. And that you're at the end in the place to defend yourself against that ac accusation. Like, you come across as somebody completely different. There's a wonderful add-on to Firefox called About Me. And I just installed that, and it actually tracks just on my computer my surfing behavior. And looking at that afterwards, I thought I was a completely different person <laughs> online than I would have was really surfing <laughs> because I don't measure myself how long I stay in different places. And that's the real danger of tracking, I think. I that people I make up stories about you. I'm, I'm currently in the market for a new cooker for my, for my home, right? So I, I did a few web searches, and now these, these cookers are following me around the web in, in a kind of... <laughs> like <laughs> it's very surreal, <laughs> but the sorry uh, for the, for the digression. But there, there, w another question, which is kind of related to this. Sorry. Well, uh, I you know in the early days of Google, and I would be writing Google Mail or stuff like that, and using Google Apps. And over on the side, I all of a sudden noticed that I'm writing about vacations. I saw I get these nice suggestions about vacations, and I actually enjoyed this. It's okay for me as long as it's over there or I have control over it and maybe I can turn it off every once in a while when I want to, but that's the problem, you know. You, you want to have control over your internet, your system, your stuff, but the trade-off is that I got to use these Google applications for free, okay? They were making their money some other way. As long as I understand that, as long as I understand the mechanism of that, as long as I can make the determination of what's happening, I'm okay with that, that's my decision to use their applications or not, okay? But when they don't tell me what they're doing, or when they, when they take information that I don't want them to have and give it to somebody else, then I have a problem with that. Because it's all really shady, isn't it? The way the online advertising is handled, the way the cookies work, you know? Yeah. If it was just more transparent and open, as you said earlier, Chris, yeah. So it's the so difference I between free and open. I, I, well, yeah, I mean, I think getting yeah. back to the kind of open agenda and the, and the, and the, and the, the kind of way that I think that to a kind of positive spin on this is that <laughs> the um, you know so w what one of the other questions that came through on the hashtag was can can the web remain truly open when, it, when it's dominated by a handful of huge corporations right and I, I think this is a it's a reasonably good question I mean I, I think not to not to pump you up too much Christian but I think <laughs> Mozilla is, is a good example of a, uh, of a counter trend to that and Firefox. I mean, Firefox is, is a brand of the web. My mother-in-law uses Firefox, right? You know, and she's a deeply non-technical user, right? So I mean, that, that, that should indicate something. But the, um, you, you know, is, is it possible, is it more possible for 
the web to remain open and, and kind of for, for that transparency to flourish, is it not more possible for that transparency to flourish in an open web environment than it is in, in a kind of environment where we're led around to app stores? I think the innovation is the problem. I mean, we have always open alternatives for closed systems. We have Diaspora for Facebook. We have App.net for Twitter. Both of them, nobody cares, except for the geeks that actually are into their privacy and actually or wrote it or whatever. Uh, it's it, we, do, we do it after the cause. Like, uh, Facebook comes out, Diaspora gets built. It, the innovation should come from the open. When, that, when we manage to get this done, and then it's going to get really interesting. And it's quite interesting to see that under the hood, the geeks that work in different companies, it flows deep in the geekdom about openness and understanding. Like when uh, uh, one of the best things to happen to HTML5 to make applications with is PhoneGap. PhoneGap actually allows you to, to uh, release a HTML5 app as an iOS app, as an Android app. That was an open source project from the very beginning. Then Adobe bought it, and everybody was going nuts for the first 20 minutes, like people do on Twitter. And then the organizers basically said, oh, hang on, PhoneGap is actually given to the Apache Foundation, which is another big open player, which we need for everything. And Adobe is making a product built on top of PhoneGap that is going to be Adobe whatever called, uh, that will do the same thing. So under the hood, it's more and more happening. The we have to be better. Mm. You sell things by being better than the closed mm. option. You don't sell things by being the open alternative. And when Firefox gives you better options to control your privacy than other browsers do and people care about it, then they choose pro Firefox. They don't choose it because it's nice and cuddly and orange. Mm. They, they want to have something out of it. We have to be better and we have to be the simple alternative and not just the open one. And that's mm. why I'm hoping with this initiative we can get this message out more as well. I think actually a potential really big threat to the web is if, if the, is if the big companies lose interest in it and don't get involved in it. Because then it will just become this kind of pirate ship, which obviously everyone here would love. But if we want this to be a scalable, sustainable platform that is going to be there for 7 billion people when they get online as a you know, meaningful and useful platform, it's vital that Adobe create their you know, graphical user interfaces in their Edge uh, products and stuff. It's vital that Google create Chrome OS and that Firefox, because Firefox is kind of a big one, even though it's got a great uh, ethos, of course, uh, Mozilla. Um, it's, I think it's super important that the big companies do uh, drive innovation on, on the web and, and keep the focus up there. My favorite is when people ask about Firefox OS, like, so you're targeting the emerging markets where you don't get iOS on Android. So what if you do if iOS and Android start targeting these markets as well? And my answer is we've won. <laughs> We want sh people to shame them into understanding that the world is that the web is worldwide and that there's lots of people out there that we haven't even tapped yet that have voices that have needs and they also have money. They also are an interesting market to sell to, but we have to uh, be the first one to bring them out. But we but we also have to understand that these are companies and it does cost money to put in the infrastructure and things like that. So I had a friend in Rio de Janeiro who lived in a slum. He wanted to provide wireless internet to people in the slum. And people laughed at him and said, nobody will ever pay you for it. Nobody has any money. But he took hardware out of the trash cans. He put free software onto it. He made his own antennas. And eventually, people started using it and then developing businesses out of it and paying him. And over time, he was able to employ six people full time providing wireless services to the slum. So, yes, they have some money. It's a very little bit of money, but the huge cost of putting in the infrastructure, and they are companies that have responsibility to their stockholders to say, we are going to maximize our profits where we can while we're still competing with people. So, you know, they're not always evil companies. They are companies. And the, differ and the difference, if you're not profitable, means you're unprofitable. If you're unprofitable, eventually you go bankrupt. Can you say the word Enron or Nortel? Okay. One mm -hmm. dirty secret is also that we think free is free, is free and free is never free. Like, we have a problem on, uh, uh, in the open technology world as well, not, not necessarily in the open source world, but in the, uh, in, in the general world, looking at something like, okay, Firefox is free, great, so my Gmail is free as well. So your Gmail isn't free, there's ads there, there's things that track you. Everything costs something, but 
people want everything free first on the web and then they actually maybe later going to pay for it. And I, I'm very happy that I'm paying for a lot of stuff. I pay for my Dropbox, I pay for my Flickr, I pay for my, uh, uh, for my uh, Dropbox, uh, no, what's the other one, Pinboard. I'm okay to spend like $50 a year for a service because then I put some effort in and I actually showed. I've seen startups now actually making their engineers buy their products and not give them for free. So they actually have a stake in the product that they're building and realizing that free on the web is just not sustainable if it's just ad-driven as we are right now. We need better ad models. Not even a mother's love is free. <laughs> if you love me, you'll take out the garbage! <laughs> True enough. But, but, but how does this play for kids? I'm sorry to keep bringing it back to the to Generation Z, Z, but uh, you know, like uh, th these are people also with not a lot of money. I mean, you know, and, and believe it or not. <laughs> not Did you say Justin <laughs> Bieber just a few minutes ago? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think they get it that it's not for free. <laughs> um, but they, they're kind of comfortable with it. it. It's an interesting one. They are they're pretty astute and they'll ferret out any opportunity they can. So you know, Gmail, they recognize that they are, they are selling at the very least, kind of an algorithm being able to get into their personal account and scan it. Um, and they're happy with iTunes because it's simple and it's nice. They'll still try and hunt out free music. And they, they know that it's illegal and they don't mind being blocked, but they're still going to try and go, kind of go down that avenue. So they're, they're pretty resourceful and they're not very fussed. You know, they feel, they feel like it's a place to be kind of quite astute and adult from a very young age, and so that they're very, very literate, and that they, they kind of they know what the deal is. But, but this, this is another advantage of the internet. It allows new business models. So in Brazil, there are new bands coming out with new models where they, they, they record the music on a CD at the soundboard. They take the CD out to the music pirates. They give the CD to the music pirates and say, make as many and sell these as many as you can. But this uh, advertises a band, brings people to the concerts, where they take the same CD that's been edited, put it in a jewel case with pictures, and sell it for 10 times what the music pirates do. So they, they, they're changing the business models to allow more people to get the music. And if you're not familiar with Creative Commons, you should be. Well, you make piracy unnecessary. You don't forbid it. Like uh, Spotify is a great example. I pay ten dollar, uh, ten pound a month for as much music as I want to listen to. I can download it to my iPod or to my Android device and listen to it in the gym. If it were only streaming online, I wouldn't pay for it because I want to take the stuff with me when I'm offline on my bicycle or somewhere else. And it's hard when it gets harder to buy to pirate than to get the legal things. Then we have a great business model. If we actually make it hard for people to use the legal stuff, when I buy a DVD in America, for example, and can't play it here, then I shouldn't be surprised that kids get creative for getting it for free. And I, I think this is one of those things that where, where I see the web having an advantage uh, in the long term, because the longer we see these, um, these, uh, these proprietary ecosystems and app stores, uh, the more... Um, Restri uh, restrictions we see on business models and the way that people can monetize and the types of APIs they can use and all that kind of stuff cro cropping up. I mean, just last week we had Google announce that they are only going to allow uh, Google apps to use the Google, uh, you know, uh, uh, Google in-app payment API as opposed to using any other payment API like PayPal, that kind of thing. But I, I, we, we, we have about only about three to four minutes left. So, um, do we have any questions, any burning questions from the audience that we haven't picked up? Okay, maybe this gentleman here. <laughs> and then I'm going to ask people to wrap up. Um, I was just wondering uh, what you make of uh, kind of DRM trying to, I, I guess, like uh, companies like um, Netflix and uh, Love Film. I guess they've been trying to promote DRM and try and get that into the HTML spec. I just wondered if you had any thoughts around that. I can give you my thoughts. I don't know whether, you know. My, I, I think open DRM is better than closed DRM outside of the web. So I think that actually DRM coming to the web is a positive thing. Um, I know that's controversial. You cannot change a market that is afraid of getting their stuff stolen by telling them you have to allow people to do it. You, they come up, 
I, I totally agree. We better come up with an open DRM uh, thing that tells me this is my copy of that video and it shows up in piracy, people knew it came from me, than having a DRM that is just locked to one device at one time. If we don't give an open alternative, the, the large corporations that want to protect their things, sometimes understandably, there's a lot of money going into a movie, even if it's a terrible movie like Transformers and stuff like that. <laughs> They want to protect it somehow, and they will find a way to protect it. If we can give them an easier way to protect it, then we actually have a good opportunity there. Um, again, I think it's unfair that I have one device where the music that I bought, when I, when did, when I dropped that device in the toilet, the music is going to have to buy it again. That's something that I don't want to have, so we have to find a better way of doing this. We will not get people who have 200 years of history of keeping things non-copyable or non-copyable to change their overnight. We have to give them an alternative that at least looks secure to them. John, any contrarian view? I don't think so. No. <laughs> 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 All right, we have to we have to we have to wrap up. Can can I can I ask people to make one closing statement, one closing sentence uh, on yes. each on the panel? Sorry. All right. So how are we going to keep the web open? That's the question. I think hardware companies who create phones need to open up their hardware to using these new APIs. Otherwise, I think we're going in a really good direction. Question. People need to complain every time something gets shut down. If your government thinks you can keep pornography off the web, good luck. You should shout about this because they're going to they're gonna stop other things as well. Okay, excellent. Make open web better. You know, the reason the Firefox took off was that it was just better than anything else back then. And if you make open web uh, apps and um, better than the closed system, then people are just going to lap it up because they care about the undeliverable. They don't care about the process. Last words. I think people have to understand what the issues are and then vote with your dollars. Hmm. Or euros. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> with your money. Okay, I have to interrupt now. Thank you. Right Thank on. you very much. Thanks. Are we all done? <laughs>